How to change it, make a difference. Go on, Leon. What the fuck is this about? <laughs> so this is a text by an organiser, Josh Virasami, who's based in London. And it's a book that he's written on the label or the imprint called Murky Books. So I'm sure you've heard of Stormzy. Essentially, this is a book endorsed by Stormzy. This is Stormzy's guide on how to change the world, how to make a difference. I mean, it's not, but the label, Murky Murky Books is Stormzy's label. So he, he set up a label to kind of get books written by and for young black kids, young people in general, people in general. And this book by Josh Furusami is, is part of that series. It's a really, really cool book. It's an introduction to how to organize, how to engage in activism, how to understand the world and why it's in need of activism and in need of social change. That's why I wanted to share it with you because I think it's just a really brilliant introductory guide to all of those themes. Plus, it even taught me, someone who's been an activist for like over 15 years, it taught me loads of stuff as well about how to organize, how to change it, as the title says. Brilliant. So what are the top three things that stuck out to you? Well, it's handy that you asked me the top three things because the book's actually organized into three parts. The first part is around education. The second part is around organization. And the third part is around agitation. In terms of education, Josh talks about, sorry, I'm saying Josh because I, I know him, he's a mate of mine. Josh covers three areas. He covers education, firstly, and he talks about his experience of school, which really resonated with me as someone who, like Josh, faced the arbitrary power of teachers, as I'm sure many of the people listening to this podcast will have done at some point, because that's the way that most British schools operate, and indeed most schools globally. You know, you have the teacher as this position of authority. If you dare to question them and their authority, then you're a troublemaker. If you're a troublemaker, that's labelled as bad. And Josh kind of flips that on his head and he says, look, my experiences of being in school and of inverted commas making trouble of challenging authority were actually really instructive because they were moments of me being engaged in like a political awakening. He says that some of the reasons that he asked questions of teachers wasn't to be cheeky, it wasn't to be rude, although he also admits that he was cheeky and rude as well at times. But the reason he often asked questions was because he would, wanted to know the answers. He wanted to understand the world better. And yet he also points out that one of the ways in which school is organized is to stop us from understanding the world better, stop us from wanting to know more about how the world is organized organized and to discourage us from asking those critical questions so that mundane like process of a teacher saying don't talk back to me you know don't ask me that question that's not just them stamping their authority on you it's also a way in which the society that we live in gets reproduced without challenge so people get forced into being compliant being complacent not challenging not asking the hard questions and that's not a natural state of affairs he points out that kids growing up are innately inquisitive they want to know and understand the world and it's through this process of education that they get beaten down and beaten down Right. So following on that, would you say that he's addressing education as an institution for indoctrination? Does he speak on that? And do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, no, he precisely talks about education in relation to what, I mean, he gets deep. I don't know how deep we want to get in our conversation. One of the things I like about the book is that he has these little sort of text boxes where he goes into some concepts in more depth. He recommends further reading. In the general text itself, it's very kind of readable. It's very light and you can kind of just follow it without knowing too much. But for instance, here on one of the pages, he talks about ideology and he uses the concept of ideology. That is the ideas and beliefs and symbols that help to persuade people that the way that things are is the way that they should be he talks about education's role in that process of reproducing those ideas that ideology so yeah he does i'd say in answer to your question he does do that and going back to how it relates to us to breathe to organizing and to activism how would you say that the text helps in understanding how to organize to change the world yeah, I mean, in tons of ways. So in terms of education, he's talking about the need to have our own education. So the work that we're doing here on Campfire Stories, for instance, is an example of that. All the work that you guys do as the comms team is an example of that. We are sharing understandings and analyses of how the world is with people to help them to help re-educate them or not. I mean, re-educate has a very bad connotation in terms of... Uh, More like unlearn, perhaps. Unlearn, I like it. Yeah, yeah, that's less loaded. To unlearn a lot of the ideology about how the world is and to provide a different source of education and ideas. I just remembered that in a previous podcast, the one on degrowth, you spoke about the experience economy and how university and higher education is now also part of that experience economy, which I found really interesting because you're a professor or an ex-professor of a university. So yeah, how does that link back to your work? And how do you actually now feel about university having had quite an intimate relationship with it? That's, that's such a weird way to put it, but like, yeah. 
yeah no me and universities were snogging and now now we're, we're just friends in fact we're not even friends we're on like a separation no to the less dispatch dispense with that um, <laughs> weird relationship metaphor so he doesn't really he talks a bit about universities in the book so he talks a bit about his dropping out of university so he dropped out I'd say he's probably one of the most educated people I've come across. And yet he didn't complete the degree that he started at university. And part of that is because, yeah, the way that universities are set up is similar. They, they're extensions of the education system that we talked about in relation to schools. So they are very hierarchical. They are institutions that we've inherited from a really oppressive way that society has been organized. So my experience of working in universities has been that on one hand. On the other hand, though, at times I've managed to find and create spaces where we can push back against those oppressive structures. And as we speak, right now university staff are on strike or at least there's like a live active strike mandate and part of that is around the fact that the government has been trying to attack higher education with a part of its war on woke and it's like anti-critical race theory and it's anti-gender progressive politics and all of this and so the university is also a site of struggle it's also a battleground as are schools even if it might feel like the power is stacked against the student or stacked against the worker or stacked against the pupil but i remember some of my friends biggest politicizing moments were organizing school strikes against the Iraq war. In spite of these institutions being really oppressive in the way that they're structured, there's also opportunities for people to come together and resist them and organize collectively, which is, I guess, the important thing. Yeah, you're saying that to someone who started off as a school striker. There you go. You know, for climate. (laughs) Exactly. Like, I, I, that gave us, that gave like older people like me such hope to see the young generation kind of yeah continuing with struggle and organization and and the only group in society that was reacting with any measure of a, appropriate level of response to the coming crisis you know mm. but i bet you got disciplined for that did you um not very harshly because i i did it during a period of time that actually was quite convenient it wasn't this super transgressive mm, thing that's interesting, yeah yeah it didn't feel that deep <laughs> so tell me about the second section of the book then Yes. So the second section of the book is organized. He breaks it down to three subsections. So he says you have to find your people. So you have to find people who have had an educational awakening or not necessarily even had an awakening, but people who are going to be aligned with you, who share your interests. You have to organize with them. So that means you have to come up with a strategy of how you're going to achieve the aims that you need to achieve. And you need to get strong. So you need to do that work of building the counter movements that are going to be able to challenge the oppressive structures that you're coming up against. And so there's lots of different examples he draws on of movements from across time and space. He talks about the Black Panthers, who are big in the US. He talks about examples from the suffragettes. He talks about decolonial movements, you know, radical armed struggles against colonial oppression, loads of different kinds of collective action. But these things they shared in common, that they needed to get together with people who had the same interests as them, and they needed to form a strategy. So they need to have a sense of how they were going to achieve their aims. And then they needed to get strong, build their power and find a good way of organizing that strengthened their power. He mentions the concept hegemony, and I don't want to get too much into concepts and theories, but like this idea of basically just about power, who has power and who doesn't. Like that's the most simplistic understanding of it. And yeah, the need to build a counter power. So that's what organization's for. That's why you don't just try and do these things on your own, right? If you try and do it on your own, it's easy for those who have power to just squash you. So Greta Thunberg is an interesting example because she did just go out on her own initially, but then she became a figurehead of a much bigger movement, which involved, like you said, tons of people where then it became much harder, like for them to target you, that would have been a lot more difficult than if you were just doing it on your own, right? Yeah, for sure. And it became this socially acceptable thing to do, you know, where we had classrooms and teachers and children just coming along to these protests. But moving on to the third section of the book on agitation, what does this mean? What does this look like? And should we be doing it? Yeah, so the the first two, educate and organise, you need to understand the world and what's wrong with it, and you need to have a sense of how it might need to change, and then you need to organise, so you need to find people with whom you can change it, and who you can help build your shared understanding alongside. Then once you've done that, you have to agitate, you have to take action, essentially, because nothing's going to change without you and your your people who you're organising and struggle with, unless you take action. So he talks about getting protesting, getting teaching, and getting free. I guess getting free is like the ultimate goal. We all want to be free, we want to get rid of the powers that oppress us and and stop us from living free full lives I mean, we're often told that like the left or the movement doesn't want you to be free whereas actually it's we want people to be more free we can see that people aren't free at the moment we want more freedom but anyway the point of agitation is that that's how you get to freedom you you have to take on and challenge power so you have to build that dual power the counter power you have to build a big enough movement with enough people involved that you are able to turn things around and, and push them in a new direction so in terms of climate that's obviously massively important because of the fact that things are on such a harmful trajectory Impending doom, as I like to say. 
Impending doom, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, upon reflection, do you think this is a good guide for people who are asking themselves what to do about the state of the world? I think this is a really useful guide for people who are asking themselves what to do about the state of the world. Like I said, it's going to be especially useful for people who are just starting to think about these things or who maybe who haven't even thought about them in this way before. But for someone like me, who I would consider myself to have been thinking about these things for a long time, I got a lot from it as well. And it's just a useful refresher. And there were lots of bits of information in there that I hadn't come across before. Examples that I thought, oh yeah, I haven't thought about that before. I haven't known about that. There are connections to things like culture. So he makes connections to the work that rappers do or have done in popularizing critical ideas. And he, he cites lots of examples such as Tupac and Kano and Lil Sims more recently. Tupac was like, wasn't his mama Black Panther? Or aunt? His, yeah, his auntie was a, a member, it was a Black Panther, yeah. So he, he had that, I guess, in his family. But yeah, no, as, back to your question, like it is a really important book. I think it's very small, it's readable, it's affordable, it's concise, it's really well written. To me, as a young, I don't know, I'm, I'm not still technically young, am I? But as a black man reading it, it kind of resonated in terms of experiences of schooling, prejudice and so on. But I think there's tons of information in there that will resonate with everyone's experience of just living in the world and being in the world and kind of just getting a sense that things could be better and that we need to try and understand how to make them better. And he gives us like a, a load of kind of practical tips and, and guides based on tons of successful organizing experience. I mean, the guy has been really active in lots of organizations that have had a huge impact Black Lives Matter UK, London's Renters Union, just to name two, and then tons of others. But it's also humble. He's not like a, he's not bragging about all that he's been involved in. He's just kind of sharing his experience and his wisdom. And he doesn't say this is the end of the journey. He's like, this is a contribution to an ongoing struggle. Us with this podcast here, we're contributing to it as well. And we're just giving him another little piece in the puzzle. And we have got to get free. And the only way we can do that is with everyone getting involved. So yeah, I think it's a really, a really good book. Yeah. And what tips and tactics stuck out to you? I mean, stuff like on how you find new sources of information, how you kind of unlearn the harmful or like the, the really useless educational techniques that have been, been forced upon us from a young age or stuff in there about how you build an organization that's got strong foundations so that it can withstand the challenges that it's going to face if it becomes successful. Specific, he, you know, he gives examples of specific activities that you can do with an organization to help that organization vision and imagine what the future should look like. So there's lots of things like that that stood out to me it might be that we explore them in our how we get free series because that's the whole point right that sounds like a good idea to me yeah so we'll follow up on that wicked class class and race and gender and uh <laughs> <laughs>